Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Lavalley. I'm a Muskeg Lake Cree Nation from Treaty 6, and I'm also an assistant professor here at the College of Law. And I am pleased to welcome you to Food Deserts in Saskatchewan, the Right to Food Security, a panel discussion presented as part of the McCurcher LLP lecture series at the College of Law. As we gather here today, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I would like to begin by thanking McCurcher LLP for sponsoring our lecture series for the last four years and allowing the college to continue to present a wide range of informative, educational, and entertaining speakers to the law school community. I would also like to thank the students of Level for selecting this important topic and helping to coordinate this event. On that note, I'd like to invite Tristan Mohammed, the program manager for Level, to tell you a bit more about their organization. Hello, everyone. It's really exciting to see so many people out here engaged in this topic. I personally haven't been to the University of Saskatchewan before, so I didn't know what the turnout would be like, but having a background in environmental management myself, I was really thrilled when I walked in and saw that this is the degree of engagement. Um, before going any further, I just want to mention my name is Tristan, and I'm the program manager and a lawyer with Level. Uh, I just want to give a brief background on Level and what we do so you understand how this fits into the programming and how this came about today. Um, Level was co-founded in 2004 by Catherine McKenna, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. And we're a Canadian charitable organization that's been combating injustice for the last 15 years. We're a small group of lawyers who believes in our mission statement, which is leveling barriers to justice through advancing empathy, disrupting prejudice, and, advance, and building human rights. Um, I know that sounds like a lot, and sometimes getting out of law school can be a bit difficult to uh, see how we can really affect change, but what this translates to is three main program areas. The first is our National Justice Education Outreach Program designed for Indigenous youth. The second is our research and advocacy programming. And the third is our training and mentorship for law students and legal professionals. So our Indigenous Youth Outreach Program has actually been operating for the last 15 years. Uh, we currently have a, a national outreach of 400 urban and on-reserve Indigenous youth annually. And this includes a location in Saskatoon led by, by our program le leader, Rihanna Worm, who's the president of the Indigenous Law Student Association here on campus. IOP was created as a small pilot project in Toronto in 2012 and is now recognized nationally as one of the leading justice education programs. Through the program, youth work with lawyers and legal professionals to participate in experiential learning opportunities designed to build relationships of trust and break down some of the prejudice that currently exists in the justice system. Our Blazing Trails mentorship program is designed to provide law students with mentorship opportunities as to how they can build out alternative legal career paths, and our mentors are composed of lawyers who've done just that. Our training programs engage legal professionals in recognizing and responding to systemic and inherent bias and learning how they can incorporate empathy into their legal practice. And finally, our human rights research and advocacy programming is part of why we're here today. This program aims to foster the next generation of innovative and entrepreneurial leaders that are aware and capable of responding to complex social justice challenges. And as part of this program, we operate level student chapters at eight law schools across the country, including a loca location here at the college. Now, past themes have included advancing reconciliation, human trafficking, and refugee rights, to name a few. However, this year, our campus chapter has been fo focused on the concept of environmental justice in Canada. And I, I really just want to take a moment to thank Laura Sean and her, ama her amazing team, because having worked with law students for the past while now, I can say that I haven't met a more dedicated group of students. They've really taken up the concept of environmental justice and ran with it, and they've been such a strong presence here on campus for bringing that concept into the forefront of, of uh, consciousness for students. So with that, I'm just gonna wrap up and turn everything over to uh, Dr. Lavalley again. I just wanna mention that I am facilitating an empathy training event tomorrow on campus from 1 to 2.20. Uh, it's free, it's here in the Faculty of Law, so if anyone's interested, feel free to come up and speak to me afterwards. We only have a few more spots though, and they're going quick, so definitely make sure you talk to me quickly. Um, with that, thank you to the University of Saskatchewan and McCurch LLP for making this event possible, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Lavalley. Thank you, Tristan. Today's panelists today 
include uh, Glenda Abbott on the far side. Uh, Glenda Abbott is a uh, Neo Plains Cree from Pelican Lake First Nation. She has dedicated much of her time learning about knowledge keepers to, re to revitalize and reclaim Indigenous knowledge systems. This work has included many Indigenous-led community projects and cultural revitalization initiatives related to Indigenous midwifery, women's teachings, traditional medicine, ethnobotany food sovereignty, and land-based education curriculum development. Grant Wood. Okay. Grant's passion is with urban agriculture, which includes small-scale food production and local food security. Grant developed Plant Science 235, Urban Agriculture, which draws almost 100 students per year from across the campus. This course helps students learn how to grow food within city limits, both from a domestic and commercial basis. He is also very involved in the local urban food mo movement and can be found promoting local food production to a wide variety of audiences. Grant's work has been recognized locally, provincially, and nationally, and he has received university awards in teaching plus outreach and engagement. His most high-profile project is the Egg Bio Rooftop Garden, a containerized rooftop vegetable garden at the U of S. This research and demonstration project exemplifies local food production, sustainability, and community. Dr. Rachel Angler Stringer is an, is, a, is an associate professor in the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology. Well, I had this right before, and now I'm like stumbling on it. Okay, community health and if I don't look at the word epidemiology in the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan <coughs> and a researcher with the Saskatchewan Population Health and Evaluation Research Unit. She is currently the chair of the Saskatoon Food Council. She has a doctorate in nutrition and her research interests include community food security, food environments and food access, food system sustainability, health promotion and community-based and, and uh, participatory research. Gord ends. Gord's food and agricultural career has spanned more than 30 years. Following completion of a BSI in agriculture, Gord worked on a food security project in Zimbabwe, after which he joined Saskatchewan <coughs> Agriculture. In 2002, Gord became the first Canadian employee of Heifer Project International, completed an M.Ed., and went on to the founding director of Heifer Canada with staff and programming focusing on grassroots agricultural projects across Canada. Gord is currently the executive director of the Saskatoon Food Council and is active in his family's organic farm at Osler. Okay, so we're a little tight on time today. So what, what I'm going to do is there will be a series of four questions, which might actually only be two, because <laughs> um, we do want to see if there is any, we're hoping to have at least maybe one, one or two cues from, from the audience so they can do the A's, right? Um, each panelist will have about two minutes to address the question that we proposed, and once we run through these four, maybe a little less, we will open the floor for those in attendance to ask a question. Okay. Is there any other questions right now? Just get a jump on it, right? Just kidding. So, question, question one, um, and we'll start with, with Glenda and come this way, and then we'll go the next one, we'll go that way. So, um, how would you describe food insecurity in Saskatchewan? Um, so we kind of talked a little bit before we um, came up here. Uh, we're all kind of focused on different things, but I guess my focus has been on understanding um, Indigenous relationships in Canada related to food insecurity. And um, for, for me, that begins with um, colonial systems and the way that it was imposed on Indigenous communities. So I'm in, in under two minutes, I'm going to spend a couple seconds I'm just kind of talking about the history of um, food insecurity and kind of um, where we are today here in the province. So when we think of the last time Indigenous communities w were food secure, it was here on the plains, it was the time when the bison were still roaming these fields, and then we know that there was a very um, uh, in intentional uh, removal of the bison from the plains. When that happened, um, Indigenous peoples signed treaties, they were forced into small tracts of land called reservations. On these reservations, they were given flour, lard, uh, I forget the five right, sugar, salt, and, and then later milk, um, or pork fats. Um, <clears throat> and um, so when that happened, the pass permit system was introduced, and that pass permit system um, basically created a system of dependency. So even if you were successful in farming in your community, um, you weren't allowed to trade, barter, or sell without the permission of an Indian agent. So, um, so that meant where you were getting your food from was locked within a few mile 
um, radius. It was, you're literally boxed into your community. Um, so when we think about the, the colonization of Canada as a country, Canada, um, originally you were taking raw goods from Canada, putting it on a boat, shipping it back to Europe. Um, later, that, that same system of colonization was um, reintroduced in the development of provinces. So here in the province of Saskatchewan, in northern Saskatchewan, we have uh, an intentional underdevelopment of the north, where you take raw goods, things like uranium, oil, gas, whatever the resource would be, and you take that raw good to, to basically make the south rich. And so that intentional underdevelopment of the north is one of the leading contributors to our food insecurity here in Saskatchewan, right? So, so it's primarily Indigenous populations that are, um, that are in the north. Many don't have roads to their communities. These are also the communities where um, industry and resource extraction levels are very, very high. And so when we think about um, food insecurity, it is the very intentional systems that were created to impose cycles of dependency for indigenous peoples in this province, right? Yeah. <laughs> trying to see it. I, I think I had other notes. <laughs> but but those, were, those were basically them. So when we think about um, food insecurity, it's, it's all of the ways that food was used as a weapon and all of the ways that we as indigenous peoples in this country known as Canada are dealing with the health impacts, the social impacts, the cultural impacts, and basically systems of dependency repeated again and again and again. Thank you. Thank you. I'll keep it really short. Um, there is food insecurity in Saskatoon and in the province. There are many, many factors that cause or lead to food insecurity. And remember that food insecurity is not just about food. There's a huge number of social factors related to food insecurity. Okay, so um, I, 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 had a, I had an idea of what Glenda would say and what Grant would say, and I, know, and I have a pretty good idea as to what Gord will say, so I decided to say something different from what they will say. So um, I teach in the area of uh, food systems and health. Food, food security or food insecurity, depending on how you frame it, is defined at multiple levels. So I think it's really important for everyone in this room to have a sense of what we're talking about. So there's a global or national level when we talk about food security um, that has to do with quantities of food being accessible on a, on a regular basis and, and, and so on. There's also something we call community food security, and I'm not gonna talk about that right now because that's kind of what, that's kind of what Gord is gonna talk about. And then there's the food, in, food insecurity, and this is how we frame it in this country, is as insecurity that is experienced at the household level. And that is a kind of food insecurity that m probably most of you think about, people being hungry, needing to go to the food bank, and so on. So it's important to recognize that fo household food insecurity is something that has four dimensions, quantitative, qualitative, social, and psychological. Quantitative, enough food, qualitative, sufficient quality, nutritious food, social and psychological, meaning that you acquire it in ways that maintain your dignity and that food is culturally appropriate. There's a few other elements to it, but that's the basics of what we're talking about. In this country, we've got about 12.6% of people who are food insecure and that, there's, that is on a spectrum from marginal being a bit worried, anxious about food to not eating for entire days. So it's a spectrum, but over 12%, between 12 and 13% of people in this country experience food insecurity. And I would say it's not a problem of food, it's a problem of poverty. If you track food insecurity at the household level or at the individual level, next to poverty at the household or the individual level in this country, they track extremely closely. So that's all I'm gonna say right now. Pass it on to Gord. Thanks, Rachel. And Linda and Grant. Um, yeah, I want to kind of frame the conversation in terms of the food system and to think about all the processes that end up in bringing our food, you know, onto our plates. And it's a very complex system in many regards. It starts with farmers, it starts with seed, and that's kind of the foundation of it all. But then it includes everything else that happens to get that food onto our plate. And um, just thinking about um, how that system works and the fact that um, it's dependent really on long-distance kind of transport. Now I was thinking about 
uh, what I ate for dinner last night. And I just wanted to kind of go through that quickly to relate how that, the reality of that. So we had our grown kids over and their partners for dinner and we decided we'd have uh, a Buddha bowl. So the foundation of that was quinoa. And there's quinoa grown in Saskatchewan, but the stuff that I had in my cupboard was grown in Bolivia. So right there, I'm, I'm supporting a, a very long distance kind of system. We had vegetables. Uh, we had carrots. They happen to be from Alberta. Um, we grow a garden every year, but we've long blown through all that. So we rely on the supermarket uh, kind of system to supply us with vegetables. Um, we had chicken, and we grow some chicken ourselves, again, long blown through that. We do have a neighbor that grows chicken. So there's some local food that I was able to use in that meal. Um, tofu was part of it because we have some vegetarians in our family. Again, you know, I don't even know where that comes from. And so that system um, very much influences food security. I, we're I'm just going to suggest that as, as a point of conversation here that um, are we food secure in Saskatchewan if we rely on a system that is based on bringing food from a very long distance? So there's inherent in that is a whole lot of diesel fuel for transport. Our system is also very much um, based on using diesel fuel to produce food. So there's questions, there's environmental questions, there's social and health questions around that. But I just want to kind of frame that as my way of looking at the food system from a very, um, how does that affect us? Are we food secure in Saskatoon and Saskatchewan if we depend on a system that is based on long-term transportation? And basically about 10 kilocalories of diesel fuel to produce one unit of kilocalories in terms of food energy. So that, that's the reality of the food system, and that's how I kind of want to contribute to this conversation. Thank you. Um, what, are, what are examples of, and we'll start this time right here, with the, what are examples of innovate, innovative solutions that you know or can think of to combat um, Canadian food insecurity? Okay, so I'm up again. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there are many examples of organizations that are trying to frame alternative food systems and encourage alternative food systems. Politically, um, our federal government came out with, or when they were first elected, the mandate to the, to the uh, Department of Agriculture was design a national food policy. Canada has no national food policy. So that's in the works and it's expected to come out. Um, there's questions around how that, how much influence actual citizens have into that. Is it more industry bias? So that, that's one thing I think we need to be aware of. I think more hopefully though are the citizen or kind of civil society based efforts. Food Secure Canada is an organization that has been working and I actually worked with them way back on the People's Food Policy Project and that was talking to Canadians about what do we actually want to see in our food policy? Do we favor a system that is more reliant on local systems or a relationship, direct relationship between consumer and farmer. Um, here, more locally, we have organizations that are trying new things. Chep Good Food is working on a mobile food market. And I really encourage support of that. At a very basic level, there's the Mother Center in Station 20, and there's no more food security that's more basic than how a child starts out in life where they advocate for breastfeeding. That's a very important part of food security and all we can do to encourage that basic food security. Um, we have some resources on our website. Food by Ward is one where we can look at Saskatoon and we can say where are there food assets in our city and where are there not. Very importantly, where are there areas in Saskatoon where we have a lack of food assets, whether they're grocery stores, community gardens, food programming, collective kitchens, etc. Maybe I'll stop there. So if I'm going to speak to the point that I made before around poverty, about household food insecurity being about poverty, then the solutions are solutions that deal with poverty. Um, so those solutions, I would argue, there's a number of them. Um, two that come to mind first are guaranteed incomes. So there are a number of organizations, in fact, hundreds of organizations and individuals who are doing research and who are um, studying the impacts of guaranteed incomes. So 
Uh, that to me is one solution to, to um, household food insecurity, living wage campaign. So all of those uh, organizations and individuals working towards ensuring that everyone, regardless of what kind of job they have, gets paid uh, a living wage to do that. So should be able to feed themselves and their family on that, uh, on that wage. Um, but I also speak as a researcher who studies food and food access. So I, I'm always very conflicted when I talk about this because I don't want us to get distracted from the issue of poverty and where poverty comes from. And poverty comes from a few places in this country. One of those is our colonial past and present. Um, and, and there are others as well. So I don't want to get distracted from poverty, but I also know that uh, food access is, is all, there's also elements of, of it that are about food. So depending on where you live, you may have better or worse access to healthy food. Some, in Canada, our biggest problem is not what people talk about as food deserts. Our biggest problem is what we call food swamps. It's areas, particularly low-income areas of cities that have an overabundance of unhealthy food sources. So I live in the inner city of Saskatoon, um, and my neighborhood is a little better than most in the inner city. You, if, you, you know, if you're in Pleasant Hill, for example, you are surrounded by convenience stores uh, and very little else when it comes to accessing healthy food. Um, I'll leave it at that, uh, but, um, but I could say a whole heck of a lot more. <laughs> okay. um, being that I'm from the College of Agriculture and Bioresources, I frame everything in the, whole, in the area of productivity. That's my area, is growing things. Um, so what, things that I see um, that could help com combat food insecurity, one would be just the ability of, to sell produce from personal yards. Um, if we can have local production sold locally, keep the money within the neighborhoods themselves. I mean, that growing up in the 60s, I just aged myself, um, that's what we did. You, you, know, you, you bought and sold locally within the community, um, and there's many, many uh, studies showing that it's um, beneficial. Um, communities where there is better food uh, security have local, um, uh, local food systems, or local food systems. Um, the vacant lot bylaw amendments that we did a few years ago are speak to that. Um, that's one way that Saskatoon is addressing the issue of local sales on, on private lots. Uh, the BC Farmers Market Nutrition and Coupon Program, excellent program where um, house, households deemed in food insecure are given coupons to shop at the farmers market. Um, so the farmers market, you're getting local food, uh, you're getting um, um, food, um, um, uh, local food, th th who are, and the local people are benefiting from the sale of their produce itself, and the people who are food insecure, households who are food insecure, um, are getting access to this good food as well. Um, that's another one. The, um, the uh, CHEP mobile bus, absolutely, the produce bus, um, Ottawa, Minneapolis, Chicago, all have them. Um, access to food, taking a bus, um, or, and transferring twice to get to a grocery store then to haul back 30 pounds of produce is not, that's not, a po that's not possible. Uh, so having put the, bu put the food on the bus, truck it to those who need it and have it so it's available um, right there is an excellent example. Um, urban farms that employ people have larger or urban farms and hire people, locals, who um, uh, to, f to um, to work on the urban farms. That way you're keeping, again, keeping the money within the neighborhood, keeping the money within the community. Um, and the, lastly, the food, the food snacks, uh, school snacks, school, school um, um, uh, food programs. Um, educating the youth. Um, educate, I mean, the future of agriculture is education. Uh, teaching people about what, uh, what food is. Uh, because we've, we're, we've become c totally complacent about food. We assign no value to food whatsoever. Um, we snarf down food right now. It's, it's sustenance uh, as opposed to something to be appreciated. Um, so there's those just a few ways that I see that we can, things we can do to, to help combat food. <coughs> It's a little bit like speed dating up here where you want to get like all of your stuff out and it's like, go, all right. <laughs> um, but I'm going to focus, um, when I think about the ways that we combat food insecurity, I believe it be begins with perspective and attitude. Um, when we look at uh, food insecurity, let's say in the north or whether you're dealing with food deserts or food swamps in an urban center, um, it's not only poverty, um, the attitude that like, it, it's poverty and racism and how those two kind of work together within this province. Um, so in the north, uh, uh, 
heavily, heavily resourced. If you think about how much those resources are subsidizing the South, what, re what is required is, is a change in our thinking as Saskatchewan residents um, in thinking about what is needed in the North to subsidize a Northern food system. Um, and so that people can have access and transportation and um, not pay $20 for four liters of milk in the North while we're paying $4 um, here in the, in the city, right? Um, so I, like overall, when we look at the food system, whether here in Saskatchewan or anywhere in the world, it's looking how, at, at how systems of colonization, global food systems, World Bank, all of these systems kind of, kind of work to keep certain people oppressed within their countries, whether it be Bolivia, Central America, where we get our bananas from, where we somehow need to shift our thinking. And we need to remember that Africa was not, is not a poor country. It was one of the richest countries in the world that many people took many, many resources from. And that they were left with all of the after effects of being oppressed peoples. And that here in this province of Saskatchewan, we are no better because that same oppression is happening in northern Saskatchewan. It's happening in inner, inner city Saskatoon, inner city Regina. It is happening in First Nations communities. And so really, the shift has to happen inside of our brains where we say every single person deserves a right to food and a right to water. And those are the ways. And how do we do that? Here in this province, we look at poverty and we look at racism and how those two are actually impacting this veil that each and every one of us is experiencing every single time we go and buy food for $100 and someone else in the north is buying it for $1,200. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, do you feel that the law can help or be a barrier for food security? And if so, why? We'll start with Rachel. I think there's lots of ways that the law can be bo on, on both sides of this. So um, I, it kind of depends what we're talking about. So Glenda and I <laughs> are working on a project together where we are um, listening to people uh, across this country trying to um, figure out a way to come up with um, recommendations within an action plan for improved uh, indigenous food, traditional food, country food, depending on the language you want to use for indigenous peoples in urban residing indigenous people in this country. Um, so we've been having a lot of conversations about the law <laughs> um, and ways that public health, so I, I'll speak about public health because I am, um, I, that's my world. Um, the ways that the public health <coughs> laws that we have in this country um, in, can in, impinge on uh, our ability to uh, eat culturally appropriate food um, a, in particular, but also to, to especially the qualitative dimensions of, of qualitative and social dimen dimensions of that household food insecurity I, sp I spoke about. So um, the example that I give frequently and I've said a few times in the last few days is around um, inspection. So if you, um, if you want, if you as an urban residing indigenous person want to eat uh, your traditional, especially meat, we're talking about meat in particular, um, foods, say when you're in the hospital or say when you're at school or in any kind of institution or in any kind of public place that's not so outside of your home, you are, there, there are rules that you have to follow when it comes to public health. Um, and it's very difficult to do that. There's all these, you have to either sign waivers for people or um, we've just experienced this. Um, in some places, it's just not possible at all. Um, it's, it, it's very, very challenging. And so the argument that gets made, I would make here, and that'll be the last thing I'll say on this, is that when we talk about meat in particular, risk is a topic, a really important topic. The risk involved in 15 or 20 um, indigenous elders in a hospital eating uh, caribou stew from a single caribou that was hunted and then prepared and then, uh, and then those people eat it, the risks involved are very, very small. In that, there's 15 or 20 people who may be imp impacted if something were to go wrong by some chance. But remember, it's only coming from one caribou, so you know the source. So as awful as it would be if those people were, got sick, think about it in comparison to a large meat packing plant where the vast majority of the meat in this country comes from. 
if something goes wrong, we've got thousands, some cases maybe even hundreds of thousands of people who could be impacted. How is it that the way that our public health acts in this country work at the CFIA level, so at the federal level, as well as at the provincial level, how is it that those two risks are deemed equal? Unless you're not ready. Well, <laughs> it's kind of getting out of my area, but I mean, we do know, um, following, following one court case in the U.S., any laws that prohibit the production of food, local food, um, uh, can be a very negative thing. And there are jurisdictions in the U.S. where you are not allowed to grow food in front yards, for example. Um, and that is re, um, higher end neighborhoods, for example, where the growing of vegetables is deemed to reduce the pro property value of houses. Um, and there is a fairly good sized law, lawsuit going on there. Uh, we do not have, to my knowledge, any of these in Saskatchewan. Um, so we're allowed to grow vegetables in your front yard, and I'm all about growing fruit and vegetables. Um, any, any laws that prohibit the selling, uh, bylaws, city bylaws that prohibit the selling of food, I will also deem that as being a negative, having a negative impact on uh, availability of food uh, locally. Those are the main two that I see. Okay. Linda? <clears throat> um, so I would say um, when we look at laws, we're looking at, at it from one legal framework system, and that's the Canadian legal system. And, and I know in this, in this country, Canada, we actually have three legal, um, legal systems. We have three systems of law in, in Canada. And, and one of them is, is driven by Canada itself, so we have the municipal, provincial, and, and federal. Um, and then we have an imposed system, that, a system that was imposed on not only Métis communities, but we have a system that was imposed in First Nations communities as well. Um, but we also have inherent laws. And these inherent laws are the ones that come up in, in court cases when Indigenous peoples are fighting for their inherent right, a way of life on their land. And these laws are, are, are like from the beginning of our creation stories and the way that we are governed in our relationships to plants, water, animals, how we are able to say that if we followed these laws a thousand years in the future, we would still have good water, fresh air, food for our children. These are the laws that, that Indigenous peoples were given um, by our creator through our stories, um, passed down generation after generation. Now, when we're looking at how that interplay um, comes into talking about Aboriginal rights, rights that were um, uh, re um, not reinforced, uh, the, the Constitution, <laughs> Section 35, um, and treaty rights and, and all of these things, they actually go back to inherent rights, inherent law, the laws that, that govern everything that, that makes me a Nehia woman, everything um, about how I pick my plants, how I gather them, how I hunt my, my moose or my deer or my elk. Um, it's in this relationship of how Canadian law seems to superimpose like uh, 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 their authority over everyone else, right? And, and really when we signed those treaty agreements, we saw our law and their law working alongside each other. And these are, this is the oldest basis of treaty relationship in Canada. Um, it, is, it is the one when people say treaty rights have yet to be acknowledged or recognized. It is that our laws, the ways that we want to govern our people, the way that we want to hunt our meat, eat our food, is not being recognized. And it's not being recognized, especially in urban populations, um, where 56 of Indigenous people are actually res residing today. And um, so when I, I can't remember the question, but... <laughs> I'm like just talking now. <laughs> it's like give a girl a mic. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm like, um, yeah. So I'm gonna just leave it there. It's just understanding um, that there's more than one uh, legal framework that is in operation here in Canada, and and I'm not sure how many people, just a show of hands, even know what I'm talking about when I say Indigenous law, Indigenous inherent laws, right? Okay, so those indigenous inherent laws and all of the principles that guide those laws, those are the laws that we need, recognized and affirmed and, and respected. Okay, thank you. 
So it was, do you feel that the law can help or be a barrier for food, food security? Thanks for bringing us back to that. <laughs> <laughs> she did. I, she did answer it. Yeah. No. She forgot. Very it good. Was. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was going a different direction though in my head, but maybe just let me go there for a minute. Yeah. Um, you go. Gardening okay. is a, suburb, a subversive act. If you agree with that, I, I think that growing some of your own food takes back a little bit of power from a system that has really taken away a lot of things. And Rachel was talking about. Uh, inspection and we used to have a lot of capacity around small abattoirs where you could uh, get livestock slaughtered that's that's basically gone in the countryside and so that you know in terms of when I think of laws and some of the forces that are out there there's right now a very strong debate about seed and about who who has the right to control seed and can farmers even save seed so for me, that, that verges, that, that is a piece of a legal or a conversation that's really important for our own food security and our food sovereignty. Um, I would propose, and something that the Food Council is interested in, in doing as, as part of taking back a bit of control, is, is we want to go forward with another backyard chicken pilot project. And that, I mean, that's a... An example of food sovereignty, and it's, it's, it's a tiny, not a lot of people maybe want to keep chickens in Saskatoon. However, for me and for many people, it's an example of taking back some control and saying, no, I have the right to, to produce some eggs in my backyard. And they actually make less noise and smell than a dog barking and doing what else the dog does in the backyard if you look after them. So it's an example of there's laws now, there's bylaws in our city where you can't do that. And many, many cities across North America and, and traditionally in other parts of the world have always supported that piece of, of taking a, a bit of control from the food system. Um, yeah, and Grant, I mean, as the Food Council, we're very interested in supporting the growing and selling of food, and there are a lot of legal kind of uh, implications involved with changing that policy, which is an important piece of food security. Okay, um, since we have about uh, only about 20 minutes left, <coughs> maybe a little bit less with, with thanking and then leaving, because I know at one o'clock there's uh, classes for uh, a lot of people that are in in here. So uh, what I would like to do is, if people do have questions, we'll open it up. To the floor, and if not, I've got 20 more. Just kidding. <laughs> so, anybody want to rise? And there is a, there is a mic there, but if you, oh, we have one question. Okay, I'm just going to repeat it just in case the live stream, so it might not be exact though. Okay, so the question was about food waste and that there are certain areas in the city that have excess of it, um, and what are your, your thoughts on, on helping alleviate that? Okay. Yeah, maybe I can start. Um, across Canada, there's organizations that are, are working at this issue, and, and one of the kind of innovative or exciting ones here in Saskatoon is called Food Renew. And their um, university students have come up with an app that um, will help match, say you're a restaurant or a grocery store or a, some food producing organization that ends up with food that you need to go somewhere. So the app would actually connect that entity with an entity that needs food, whether it's the Friendship Inn or um, the food bank, etc. So there are there are uh, steps in that direction. I would say, you know, in, in Saskatoon, we have a real challenge. Like just this morning, I heard that one of our councillors wants to talk about not implementing composting. So to me, that's a piece of the food waste challenge. Like food waste is a food systems challenge. It's, it's how we deal with, first we have to reduce it, but then we have to deal with food waste. And composting and contributing to the kind of urban agriculture that Grant is talking about is, is just a really important piece of that whole challenge. There's many other aspects. So one of the things that we've seen in um, 
some cities, so uh, in Europe, uh, as well as the city of Vancouver, for example, has been a banning of food that is uh, edible from landfills. So this has happened in a few places. Um, and that theoretically is a good idea, uh, except that you can you ban it, and then all of a sudden all these organizations are trying to figure out how to get rid of all of their um, edible, but maybe not edible for long, uh, foods, and they are, to, to put it somewhat crassly, but as accurate, dumping it on organizations like food banks in the city of Vancouver. And those organizations do not have the capacity to deal with it. And so in the aftermath of that change in the city of Vancouver, it was really a huge struggle for those organizations to deal with the food that was coming through their doors. So I think the idea of banning, um, uh, banning edible food from uh, landfills is a good idea. But I think it has to be done very carefully. It has to be done with resources. Um, and I think that it shouldn't, so the, the concern with food waste is that people will say, oh, well, you know, we've got all these people who are food insecure at the household level, and we've got all this food that is going to waste. Somehow we have to bring those two together. No one wants to eat the food that you and I don't want to eat. That, to me, is totally an unacceptable way of dealing with issues of poverty. What we can do, so to me those are two problems, but they're not connected necessarily. They're separate problems. Um, and if we, want to deal, if we want to figure out how to, how to bring, get all that food that would be wasted into, um, so that people will eat it, well, there are ways of doing that. So in Paris, for example, there are, uh, there are community economic development organizations that have sprung up because of their food waste law, um, where they take that food, they repurpose it, they turn it into soups and all sorts of other foods, and they sell it. It's community, it, people have jobs from it. They sell it to delis across Paris. So I think dealing with food waste in those kinds of ways makes sense, but it cannot be, we've got poor people, we've got wasted food, poor people should eat the food that's gonna go to waste. Uh, food wastage starts in the field. Um, there's a lot of uh, farmers who will um, leave their grade B produce in the field simply because there is no market for it. Not, so why bring it in and sell it? So, I mean, the first thing we need to look at is the, is the CFIA rules and regulations on, on grading and also the marketing of that food itself. Um, I think that is a, uh, is a big thing. And following on, Lin, on, on uh, Glenda's and Rachel's, um, a change in attitude. Uh, breaking news people, I'm not perfect. Why do I expect perfect vegetables? Um, I mean, <laughs> There's, there is a, um, a, a, is extremely well documented. People who grow food eat food. People who grow vegetables tolerate what they grew. Um, and this, you know, we need more, a lot more, and I don't like the word tolerance because tolerance is hierarchical. People need to accept the fact that not every vegetable you produce is going to be perfect. So you eat what you grow. Um, and that says a lot about what society is too. We need to start accepting um, a lot better than we do. So I mean, yeah, so I think you know, the food grading system is, is one of the first things we need to look at. You can now buy imperfect veg or fruit on the market. You still can't buy the imperfect vegetables. They're graded out, and that is, goes back to the grading system and to the wholesaler retailers who control that. I don't really have any other thing, anything else to add to that, really. <coughs> okay. Did everybody, everybody's good? Okay. Uh, is there any other uh, questions from the crowd? There's one more. Um, I was wondering about if food is a basic human right, it is an ethical challenge to us to have an eating tree. And um, what about animal rights and the talk of abolishing slavery and the rights of animals as having the right to have a, a, a free life Okay, I'm going to try and 
summarize that up. But if anybody wants to get ready for the next one, possibly, and go to the go to the mic, that would be great. Just because I'm not sure how much people will pick up on the, on the live stream. So there was basically a two-part question, which was, if food is a basic human rights, is it ethical to have it as part of an industry? And then uh, the other one did dealt with the rights of animals, uh, whether or not they have a right to a free life. Um, would that mean um, going back to traditional hunting um, or other other things like that, where they're actually able to to like live a, a free life that isn't within um, terrible conditions? Because shouldn't they have rights equal to us? Glenda, do you want to start or? Oh. Okay, we were all like, or, or if you wanna, like these are the big you know, issues. I'll, just, I'll just say one thing though about like when I when I think about what you say, what what you said. The one the first thing that pops into my mind is you're talking about issues of urbanization and people actually leaving their family farms or or the ways that like whether you came from Europe or you're you were here that your food was kind of in your backyard, and so like these issues that you're talking about are are big issues. These are issues of urbanization. This is people leaving the family farm. This is, you know, like, like the systems that we have here in North America are not the same systems that are happening all over the world. Like this is unique to like have these dairy farms that are like thousands of cows, you know, um, to, to give us like hormones secreting milk. <laughs> you know, th this is unique to, to us in the system. If you go to, to Europe, I think there's, there is a big push to do rewilding. Um, rewilding of, of animals on the land and and, um, and and allowing the plants to come back up. This is something I think that like it's one of those attitude things. It, it's well, how do you if if we had to go back to traditional living, there isn't enough moose, deer, elk to support us. And so um, so your question is so is so big. Maybe we can look at the systems approach to to, to that answer. <laughs> um, there is, Canada has agreed, you know, signed on to the United Na Nations, the people have the right to food. Uh, what we're doing about that is another question. Um, the question about animal rights is, is very um, complex and I mean I can speak from my personal kind of uh, perspective. Um, I think that um, if we stopped eating animals, we, we wouldn't have, like one of the ways we can preserve heritage breeds, for example, is to encourage farmers who are producing certain kinds of animals, um, because if we stopped eating them, farmers would not keep them. I, you know, worked for a number of years in, uh, in Sask Saskatchewan agriculture promoting the feedlot industry, and I, I look back on that time, and I've, come to a point where I support farmers who are actually growing and finishing beef, for example, on a very small scale because I'm much more comfortable with that. That's my, that's my own choice. And so I, you know, I, I still eat meat. I have people in my family who, who don't eat meat. Um, do animals have rights? I mean, that's, I'm very interested in animal welfare. And I think it's extremely important that we work with the livestock industry, and I, and I know livestock producers, and they, they care about their animals. They're under a lot of uh, pressure to produce protein for a market that demands it. There are so many exciting things happening, whether it's cell-based clean meat, um, whether it's plant-based protein, which we all have heard so much about in Saskatchewan and all the opportunities around it. There are al alternatives to the intensive livestock system. Um, we won't get there quickly. I, I think that uh, farmers who are involved in that system, um, they care about their livestock. We, we know that. I think as consumers, though, there's nothing more powerful than the choices, those of us who are you know, fortunate enough to have to eat three times a day, that, that choice of what system we choose to support when we purchase meat or protein that, that's the power that we have as consumers, and, and that's where we can make a difference, I think, to um, animals' lives. So I guess because it hasn't um, come up, well, maybe sort of has um, in, in, the answer, in the first part of your answer around the commodification of food. And um, so 
I, um, I think the commodification of food is at, is at the root of many of our problems when it comes to the food system. Um, I'm by no means a very eloquent or a, a, an expert on this, but I can tell you that um, our food system, our capitalist food system, uh, is um, the root of so, so, so many of, of, of the problems. So the, the relationship changed, right, when our food system became one that was um, rooted in, you know, buying and selling and so on. Um, you know, I mean, I tend to look to other people who, who are much, who, who, who have uh, backgrounds in philosophy and in, and in thinking through these relationships and what they mean. Um, it's not really my area of expertise, but I, I really, I want to leave it at that and say that um, I, I don't believe that food should be something that you can only... If food is food is a basic need. We should not have to um, be struggling. Everyone should have the right to eat, regardless of income, regardless of any of those other kinds of circumstances. Um, and I think the fact that we can't exercise that right, or many people cannot exercise that right, is um, one of the most uh, one of the worst aspects of living in in a in a in a society where our economic system is based in, in capitalism. I'm good. <laughs> um, well, that leaves us with like eight minutes left. So I'm not sure if we should ask another question because I think that we'll, we'll run over, but it's also unfortunate then that we didn't like get them right down to the wire. <laughs> um, <laughs> So right now, I'd like to thank everyone in attendance. And then, of course, this gives you guys a few minutes afterwards, maybe before your 1 o'clock class, to rush the stage to talk to them. Um, but I would also right now like to uh, thank everyone in attendance here as well as on the live stream. And I would like to welcome the students of Level to come and thank our guests. Okay. Thank you.